Hello and welcome to this PCR webinar on the essential topic of TAVI in patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease. My name is Bernard Prendergast. I'm an interventional cardiologist from London, UK. And I'm joined today by my friends and colleagues from Europe, Marcus Castle from Zurich, Switzerland, and Juan Kim from Bad Nauheim in Germany. Welcome to you both. Thank you. So bicuspid aortic valve disease is something we've been familiar with as clinicians for a long time, but only in the last few years has it begun to really enter our mindset as interventional cardiologists. And Marcus, have you noticed perhaps in the last five years that you're seeing more patients with this pattern of anatomy coming forward for treatment? Yes, I think a clear yes. That we see more and more uh, patients coming with a bicuspid um, valve and um, that's a re the reason is that we um, treat more younger patients now who have more um, uh, higher incidence of bicuspid valves. And uh, in the mid of this year, I made a move from Germany to Switzerland. And what I realized there also, there are difference in between the countries. So we, I think we see much more bicuspid in Switzerland than what I have seen in, uh, in Germany. So that's an interesting observation from your own personal uh, transition from one country to another. Also, I've been involved with colleagues in Asia, particularly in China, where they see a huge amount of bicuspid aortic valve disease, perhaps as a, perhaps almost a different pathophysiology, but also reflecting the fact that they also treat younger patients by virtue of their shorter life expectancy in those countries. So there's no doubt that this is coming our way as a major treatment need. And as we think about the challenge of these patients, Juan, is it just like doing a, a plain old TAVI or is bicuspid aortic valve disease different? Yeah, I, I have to answer this question with yes and no. Uh, yes, because um, it, it really depends on the um, phenotype that you are uh, um, confronted with. And you have to be aware of the fact that patients with bicuspid aortic valve can have a huge variety of different uh, anatomic uh, uh, phenotypes. and. Um, there might be patients which are very uh, similar to tricuspid aortic valves and these patients can be treated like tricuspid aortic valves. Uh, there is no big difference in such patients. Whereas uh, we are all aware of the very complex anatomies due to the calcification, due to the fusion of the leaflets that can be very challenging. And in our institution, actually patients with bicuspid aortic valves are treated by the more experienced operators. Okay, so there clearly are important differences when it comes yeah. to the planning of the procedure and the exactly. performance of the procedure. Yeah. And of course, the better you plan and the better you perform, the better the outcomes for our patients, which is a key element. So on that note, it's, uh, it's important and uh, interesting to note that these uh, points that we've raised are uh, highlighted in the objectives of this seminar, where we hope to learn more about the challenges of TAVI in this particular anatomical subset. And we're going to learn how the use of advanced imaging, particularly CT, is, is essential to understand the anatomical configuration of the valve and how that anatomy impacts on the choice of device, critically on the sizing of the device, and as we will hear from Marcos on how we position the valve accurately to obtain the best clinical outcomes. And uh, we will be talking uh, very in a lot of detail about the, how we achieve optimal positioning uh, to reduce, for example, paravalvular leak or how to avoid uh, obstruction to the coronary arteries, which are key elements uh, in this discussion. If we think about bicuspid aortic valve disease as clinicians, we need to reflect on the fact that firstly, it is the most common uh, uh, anatomical variation affecting 1% of the population in many post-mortem anatomical series. And it's important because bicuspid valves degenerate more rapidly than their tri-leaflet counterparts. So for that reason, patients presenting with complications of their disease are often younger in the sixth or seventh decades of life, far younger than the patients we are currently conventionally treating with TAVI. We also need to remember as clinicians that bicuspid aortic valve is associated with many other anatomical variations uh, in the cardiovascular system. There is frequent associated aortopathy with dilatation of the aorta, which can be a precursor to dissection. There is an association with anomalies of the coronary anatomy and left main stem aneurysm. 
There is an association with aortic coarctation and mitral valve prolapse, frequently seen in much younger patients. And we mustn't overlook the fact that there is a genetic association in subjects with the Marfan syndrome. When we think about the challenges of the anatomy in relation to intervention, we need to remember that the, an the aorta is frequently aneurysmal and tortuous, which may have impact on our delivery uh, technologies. That the valve orifice is frequently oval or non-circular, so sizing the valve can be challenging and difficult, and we'll be discussing that in some detail. There may be implications for the selection of the particular device, uh, and we'll be discussing that in detail, comparing balloon expandable versus self-expanding or alternative technologies. And in selecting the best device and obtaining the best outcome, we of course aim to uh, avoid the complication of significant paravalvular leak, to uh, enable future coronary access should it be required in particular patients, and hopefully ensure a durable result in terms of the hemodynamic performance of the valve itself. Now, 2019 has been labelled as a leap year for heart valve disease and for intervention in heart valve disease, and that's partly because of the publication of the low-risk trials in TAVI earlier this year, when we were able to observe that in comparison with surgical counterparts, Transcatheter technology was associated with vastly superior outcomes, uh, particularly when you bear in mind the patient experience associated with a short hospital stay and a very quick recovery. But we do need to remember as interventional <coughs> cardiologists that bicuspid valves were specifically excluded from these studies. So whilst we may feel there is a mandate to treat younger and lower risk patients with TAVI versus surgical aortic valve replacement, we need to remember that that evidence base does not extend to patients with bicuspid aortic valve anatomy. And that, of course, is a, a very real issue because, as you can see on this slide, the prevalence of bicuspid aortic valve disease varies directly as a function of age. And you can see that the peak decades of uh, the frequency or the prevalence of bicuspid aortic valve disease lie between the age of 50 and 79, which is largely the, the cohort in whom TAVI is not uh, universally applied <coughs> in the current era. So that provides our background, and now maybe we should um, move on to discuss some specific features. But for, before we do so, I need to remind you that this is an interactive webinar, and it's very important to us that you uh, transmit your questions uh, at any stage during the webinar so that we can interrupt our discussion, we can pause on our slides, and we can accommodate your questions and address them in detail because that's the whole uh, purpose of this interactive webinar facility. So whilst those questions come through one, I think it would be very helpful for us now to turn to the question of anatomy, diagnosis, measurements, <coughs> these very specific features which imaging can only provide for us. Yeah, um, I would like to start with uh, the classification of bicuspid aortic valves. Uh, and um, I think everybody is familiar with uh, the classification by SIVAS, which uh, differentiates <coughs> between type 0, type 1, type 2. Type 0 is quite clear, it's biocommissural, it's uh, non rafi type, RAFE type. Uh, type 1 is the type that we encounter most frequently. And types, uh, type 2 actually is extremely rare. And uh, um, actually, the SIVAS classification is not very helpful for our daily practice. And there is another classification by Jilayavi. It is more imaging based, CT imaging based, which also um, discriminates between bicommissural and tricommissural um, um, aortic valve and uh, takes more into account different uh, phenotypes uh, within type 1. So uh, tricommissural can have a complete rough uh, uh, rave and an incomplete rave. And uh, what is uh, important to know or take into account is that if you uh, um, uh, uh, see a tricommissural aortic valve, it is uh, frequently being referred to as acquired or functional 
or tricuspid aortic valve with fused leaflets. So they're uh, uh, suggesting that this could be a, a, a postnatal phenomenon, but uh, actually uh, most of these uh, entities are congenital. This has to be uh, in our minds. And this, of course, also leads uh, um, um, the, uh, in the diagnosis uh, to a, a misleading diagnosis of uh, thinking that we, uh, we have a, tri a tricuspid aortic valve. Yeah. yeah. And these terminologies, they're often used rather interchangeably, which can exactly. cause some confusion you know, for all of us. And a, and a, and a more precise uh, wording would be very helpful. Exactly. You could even say that this is a distinction between an anatomical classification, the Sievers classification, yep. and a more practical interventional classification based upon the, um, the, the different modes of fusion. And, and does this translate, Marcus, into sort of clinical differences or your approaches in, as an interventionist? I think um, clinically important, in my opinion, is to differentiate in between rafa type and non rafa type. Whereas non rafa type is uh, anatomically very different, has only two cusps uh, on the one side. And the other side, you have uh, um, the rafa type, who is um, anatomically um, a bit similar to a tricuspid valve. Mm -hmm. But it has a rafa which, which can be calcified and uh, has an impact on, on our decision making what valve type and how we deploy it. So this distinction with, with what you see on, the, for example, the CT scans here is very important for you when it comes to planning your approach and the actual performance of the procedure. Yes. So um, we make a, a bit a different um, uh, procedure planning mm -hmm. and I think also there's the difficulties are different in both types. And okay and we've got a question here from our participants already one which is which classification should we be using in clinical practice because we've all learnt the Sievers uh, as medical students and as cardiologists in training but w which one should we use when we're communicating with each other? Yeah. <laughs> Actually in our clinical practice we use the Sievers classification being aware of the fact that it is not very helpful in clinical decision. Mm -hmm. It does not uh, discriminate between which valve we will uh, use or which, uh, which uh, uh, therapy uh, concept we will be uh, applying. And uh, it is more important to, like, to, uh, to look at uh, the anatomy in detail, to look mm -hmm. at the uh, 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 length of the rave and uh, the degree and distribution of the calcification. Mm -hmm. This is much more important and should be taken into account for future classification. And to the best of uh, my knowledge, uh, Hassan Jalavi is working on a revised classification to, uh, to take these uh, aspects uh, more into account. Well, that will be very helpful in terms yeah. of our communication with each other, won't it? But meanwhile, I think we should stick to the, 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 uh, the metaphor of just talking about what we see and, wh and what we're describing. Exactly. Marcus, just quickly before we move on, one of our participants wants to know whether there are any ongoing trials which are actually enrolling bicuspid uh, patients at the moment. So, um, you know, it's, um, um, uh, there are um, uh, trials planned also from our uh, centre, but um, enrolling um, um, beside registries, I mm. don't know specific enrolling uh, trials at the moment. Yeah, uh, I'm wondering in my mind about the Notion 2 trial, but I, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm not sure that it's um, it's uh, I'm not sure. Okay, so I think the answer is that it's a watch this space. There are trials being planned, but we need to bear in mind that we won't have the results of those for some years. So I, mean, I meanwhile, we've got to get on with with the knowledge that we have already. Yeah. So Juan, tell us a little bit more about diagnosis of bicuspid aortic valve disease and how imaging is of such fundamental yeah. importance. Regarding diagnosis, um, I just want to uh, emphasize that uh, it is really important, uh, especially if you want to treat patients with uh, TAVI, to uh, uh, at first hand recognize uh, that there is a bicuspid aortic valve. And we analyzed that in our institution. Uh, we, uh, we worked up all uh, echo reports and mm -hmm. found that from all TAVI cases that ha had been performed, only 10% uh, of patients with bicuspid aortic valves had been recognized by routine echo using transthoracic 
and in some cases a transesophageal uh, echo. And um, of course, we all know that uh, sensitivity of uh, transthoracic echo is limited due to the uh, lower resolution. TE is better uh, in its sensitivity, but this applies especially for patients uh, which have been uh, examined in uh, studies and with uh, uh, lower amounts of calcification. If you uh, go, uh, um, uh, if if you look at. Uh, uh, um, contemporary TAVI populations, you will have elderly patients with much more calcification. So it will be really difficult to uh, tell for, uh, for the uh, echo operator whether there is a, a tricuspid or bicuspid aortic valve. And in this context, it becomes uh, extremely important to have a CT analysis and uh, sensitivity using CT increases up to 95%. And if you use CT, it uh, will be important to take into account also um, uh, systolic uh, reconstructions where the bicuspid uh, phenotypes can be appreciated much, uh, much better than if you only have uh, diastolic reconstructions. Mm -hmm. And should these CTs be done in the hands of uh, cardiologists, in the hands of radiologists? Does it matter? It should be someone who is aware of the classification and of the different phenotypes of, of the bicuspid aortic valve. Mm -hmm. With type 0, no one will have a problem to recognize it's the bicuspid aortic valve. Sure. Type 1 becomes much more difficult if mm. you look at the different uh, lengths of a rave, uh, etc. And if there's a lot of calcification. So it should be someone with experience uh, in, in, in this uh, um, uh, uh, in this uh, um, um, category. Okay. And, of course, most patients who have been considered for a CT in 2019-2020 in are going to have a CT scan. But just, just for completeness, it, does cardiac magnetic resonance help us in diagnosis? Um, the resolution of uh, CMR is it depends also, uh, also which, uh, which kind of generation uh, okay. scanner you mm -hmm. have. A uh, three Tesla uh, um, a scanner will be much better than 1.5, uh, but usually it is uh, easier to recognize uh, bicuspid anatomy with mm. CT because of the with, calcification. With the calcium, exactly, yeah. and as, as we shall see, calcium is a, is a particularly important consideration exactly. when it comes to assessing these patients. So we've talked about diagnosis and we've talked about how we distinguish uh, the different anatomies and, and the improved sensitivity of CT compared with echo. What about using CT for sizing? Because choosing the size of the device is, is so critically important and this is another confusing area for many people. So yeah. give, a, give us a simple guide as to how we use the CT scan to measure our devices. Yeah. A, a simple guide is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we all are, uh, yeah, we, we all know that um, analog sizing using uh, 3D CT is the standard of care for sizing uh, prior to uh, TAVI. This is, uh, there's no discussion. We have data that uh, we can improve uh, uh, results substantially if we do that. So for uh, tricuspid aortic valve, this is the standard of care. Uh, regarding uh, uh, bicuspid aortic valves, there is a controversy uh, and uh, um, there is an uh, alternative method of sizing, which is supraanalyst sizing, which came up due to the fact that uh, there has been uh, um, uh, um, yeah, a narrowing, which is uh, um, the, the, um, the a very narrow part, uh, around four to eight millimeter above the uh, above the um, annular plane, and uh, I think Didier Cheche has done some um, analysis on that. And uh, yeah, the, the goal is to estimate the aortic orifice using either the, the perimeter or the intercommercial distance at various heights. So four millimeter seems to be the most appropriate, mm -hmm. but there is no um, consistent recommendation. Uh, on how to do it, which tool to, to use, and there is only little data about it. Mm. And it's difficult, isn't it? You know, it needs the hands of experienced or the eyes of experienced operators to reproduce these measurements. Exactly. And, and it may be that you need to do multiple different methods yep. and, and arrive at some kind of consensus measurement.
Marcus, I think you're, you're a proponent of annular measurement and, and superannular maybe you're not quite so sure of its value. I, when I'm honest, I never really understood the, the real concept behind this. And um, so it is, um, I, I think this measurement is very subjective and, um, and I think we need uh, something for daily practice and not too much values uh, who are misleading. Mm -hmm. I, in my opinion, we need one sizing uh, object and uh, in my opinion it's also in bicuspid like in tricuspid valves it's the annulus sizing and uh, my treatments I do based on annular sizing. Okay and just come back to this point about the four millimeters uh, one because I, I think that derives because the shape of the valve is a bit like the, the, the shape of a volcano yep. and four millimeters is is an important point for, for some anatomical reason can you just clarify that for us? Um, I, I think the uh, um, uh, uh, they found that uh, they, they measured different levels of, okay. of uh, uh, at the uh, so point zero uh, maybe up to and then they found or that uh, the most narrowing is found around four millimeters. Okay. Uh, I don't okay. know. I don't think it must be exactly four millimeters. I think a measurement around four to five millimeters okay. is, is appropriate. Okay, and, we're yeah. talking quite a lot about the annular diameter, but there are other features that we need to bear in mind. So the, the height of the coriostea, exactly. uh, the, any associated, a, associated aortopathy. Is there anything you want to, to add on those topics? Usually, uh, patients with a bicuspid aortic valve have large aortic root anatomies. So, uh, of course, there is always a concern of uh, having coronary uh, compromise when uh, uh, implanting a TAVI device. Mm -hmm. But if you have, even uh, though you have a, a relatively short vertical distance to the coronary ostia, if you have a wide sinus, you, you will usually have no problem with coronary obstruction. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, of course, you, you have to be careful also in regard to uh, device selection. Mm -hmm. Uh, aortopathies are uh, frequently encountered uh, um, um, pathology in patients with bicuspid aortic valve and uh, also have to be taken into account when decision making. No, is, and we'll, we'll come on to that presently exactly. when we talk about yep. choice of, de of devices and choices yep. of strategy. Um, Marcus, what about the issue of leaflet length and leaflet calcification? Thinking now about the, the very dangerous complication of coronary obstruction, is that something else that you take into account? I think you have to take it into account, but not only leaflet length and calcification, but also the width of the, uh, the sinus. When mm -hmm. you have enough space in the sinus, then mm -hmm. it's less a problem. Mm -hmm. And also the height of the coronaries when they are very far from the annulus, it's, uh, it's the risk is less than when they are very close. So there are a lot of factors you have to take into account. And yeah. sometimes balloon sizing shows you what happens with the calcification, where you push it perhaps. Yeah. So we add additional tools. To oh, and it and just, just as an estimate, what proportion of patients in your practice are you actually protecting the coronaries these days? So protecting coronaries, that's another topic. I mm. don't think we don't, we don't um, offer them a good protection when you uh, think about placing a wire or balloon or a stand into mm. the coronaries. Some um, uh, patients, we cause trouble with this technique. Yeah, for sure. and, um, and it is, uh, at the end, perhaps you can reopen a closed coronary, but it's never a good treatment no, because sure. the chimney technique, um, when you want to get back to the coronaries one day after mm. Um, uh, your valve implantation, it will be very dangerous and that yeah. cannot be uh, our So we target. need to remember that coronary obstruction is a life-threatening complication and without a good solution. So it's yeah. one that we need to predict and, yeah, and, and, and work around. There are solutions like um, basilica t um, technique to cut leaflets. Perhaps this will be a solution mm. for some of these valves. Uh, you can do it also in native valves, also in bicuspid valves. So there are perhaps some other solutions yeah. in the future. Before we move on one, sorry to go backwards, but one of our um, uh, participants wants just a bit of clarification about this intercommissural distance. They particularly mentioned the Bavard registry, which mm. is what we were discussing, Didier Chetje's work. Exactly. But can you just yeah. use the slide again just to clarify this intercommissural distance measurement? Maybe if you look at the slide uh, and the um, lower image, 
in panel A, there is an uh, image, uh, there is an example of measuring the intercommissural distance. So it's the, uh, the distance between the commissures at four millimeters. Of course, you don't see the end of the commissures because at four millimeters, uh, it's, it's, uh, you don't see the end of the commissures. But uh, I think, as already mentioned, uh, there is no consistent final recommendation on, on how to measure it, uh, you, on which uh, place exactly to measure. And uh, uh, so where, uh, I'm also not sure whether four millimeter is the final solution okay. of uh, taking uh, the, uh, the complex anatomy into account. So how do you handle this in your own practice? Because there's lots of different measurements and exactly. none of us are entirely yeah. sure which one is the best. So, what do we do in real yeah, life? Due to this uh, controversy, we uh, made an analysis uh, of our uh, um, a single center experience with uh, treating bicuspidotic uh, 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 valves. <coughs> and uh, um, all these patients have been uh, measured with, uh, uh, by um, uh, analyst sizing. And, uh, and we compared it to uh, um, uh, measuring um, the intercommissural distance four millimeter above the analyst. Mm -hmm. And the main finding, which is not shown here in the image, is that with uh, analyst sizing, we had good outcomes in the vast majority of patients. So uh, using second generation devices, we had good outcomes. There was um, high uh, device success and um, there were only a uh, few patients uh, where we uh, um, could have, uh, uh, where super analyzing would have been useful. And you can see it on the slide when you compare a super analyzer measurement, uh, there would have been a different size selection in around 40% of cases. 40, 40, 40 percent of cases. And given the good results that we had with analyst sizing in most patients, mm. a different size selection probably would have led to a worse outcome. Okay. That's what we assume. And um, <coughs> Didier Cheche uh, has put it in a similar way, actually. He is um, recommending analyst sizing in the majority of patients in some <coughs> few patients, it might be advisable to take into account supraanular measurements, especially if you have borderline situations. Okay. Yeah. So I think the message is that there are a variety of different ways of measuring the annulus, that the data supporting them all in uh, competition with each other is a little bit limited. It's very limited. It's and, only we, and we really need data. to, stick to the, stick to the modes of measurement that we're most used to so that we become familiar with our own sizing algorithms in our own uh, individual practice. Yeah. Okay. So let's turn now to device selection, because again, these measurements and these characteristics of the valve and its associated and anatomical structures are fundamentally important for, for device selection. Deal with bicuspidotic valves, you will um, have um, a, a wide variety of different uh, phenotypes. And uh, you can have, uh, um, as shown in the slide on the left hand panel, uh, very straightforward anatomies, which I would call tricuspid aortic valve-like anatomies. These patients have uh, good access, no tortuous anatomy, uh, mild to moderate calcification, and uh, in my mind, probably can be treated with any new generation uh, device. So um, there's a, a lack of data uh, in regard to uh, differential treatment uh, using uh, especially second generation devices. There are a few uh, registries um, uh, that are coming up, but uh, so this is uh, my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. If you uh, go to more challenging anatomies, and this could be uh, either uh, torches or horizontal uh, aorta, which is frequently associated with bicuspid aortic valve, uh, you may, uh, it may be uh, useful to have more flexible delivery systems and uh, systems with a more controlled deployment. And uh, even though we all know that the transapical axis is, uh, has a worse outcome in uh, most patients, in uh, this subset, uh, it might be beneficial. Mm -hmm. At least you, you should take it into consideration. Mm 
Yeah. And if it goes, uh, uh, if you we go further to more complex uh, um, Arctic root anatomies with uh, calcification, severe calcification, very irregular calcification, or even large anatomies, then I think there's a need for high radial force mm -hmm. and especially a ceiling skirt. Uh, the, the special thing about a ceiling skirt is that you may have a slight under expansion of the valve and the ceiling skirt uh, will cover the rest of uh, uh, to, uh, to prevent PVL. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you look at these examples, of course, uh, um, you, we have to ask ourselves whether all anatomies are appropriate for uh, this uh, interventional treatment. And uh, so I've, I think it is my opinion that uh, we should uh, keep in mind that also there's also a co a conventional surgery for, mm. for these patients, especially in extremely calcified anatomies. Absolutely. And, and just, just focusing on the TAVI uh, algorithm at the moment with the different devices that we have available, Marcus, what do you think are the, the relative pros and cons of, let's say, balloon expandable versus self-expanding versus retrievable systems in, in the bicuspid aortic valve anatomy? So what I think um, uh, here, um, one key point is um, the amount of calcification mm -hmm. and the use of self-expanding or balloon expanding. Then, uh, so in my um, most in my experience, most uh, bicuspid valves they are highly calcified, mm -hmm. and here uh, you are more to the right side, complex root. Uh, um, uh, anatomy and uh, here you need um, uh, a valve where you uh, who is able to push all the calcification beside. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the result will be not be good. So, in um, so a simple answer, it depends more, more or less on the amount of calcification. Mm -hmm. what okay, and the trade-off that you're alluding to is the, the high risk of paravalve leak if you don't uh, push the yeah. calcium aside equally. Then a slightly increased risk of annular rupture when you when you use balloon expanding that's technology. So that's uh, the bad side of um, of the, um, the calcification. Mm. That here annular injury is more common. But you know, uh, this uh, also. Uh, that doesn't matter if you use also um, a self-expanding valve. Mm -hmm. You have to open the valve beforehand, mm -hmm. and you have to do pre-ballooning at least to find some space for the uh, self-expanding valve. And also, this has a risk. And, yeah. Um, and the mechanically expanding Lotus valve is now back on the market after a, a period of time without us being able to use it. Do you think it will have particular advantages in this anatomy? Yes, we know it has a good ceiling, and um, this is very important. And it's uh, it has a strong frame and a, a, a strong radial force. Um, but it's a very bulky valve. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, on the other hand, we treat more and more younger patients. We want to have access still to the coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we get into conflict when we use the uh, uh, lotus valve for this. Um, but I have a very limited experience with this. Okay. Well. It's worth mentioning as well that our colleagues in China have been developing their own uh, uh, independent valve programs and the, the valves that they use, self-expanding valves that they're using in China have extremely strong radial force because they encounter uh, very heavily uh, calcified bulky valve leaflets. So these particular devices for particular anatomy and particular geographies are, 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 you know, maybe something that we will see coming through to Western experience in, in forthcoming years. Who knows? Maybe one more comment regarding uh, these uh, extremely calcified anatomies. I think, um, as a matter of fact, in most patients, even with very heavily calcified anatomies, with new generation devices, currently we are able to achieve good outcomes. Mm good acute outcomes. So PVL rate, there will be some with moderate uh, regurgitation, but in most of these patients, we will have good acute outcomes. Mm. But uh, what we have to uh, think of is uh, uh, the durability of these patients. Yeah. I think a stent expansion will not be uh, uh, even, and uh, um, we, we have to think about long-term consequences in these mm. patients. Yeah. And as you mentioned earlier, we mustn't forget, particularly as we start to treat younger patients, that sometimes surgery may well be the best option. If there's a very heavily calcified valve, a, a higher risk than usual of coronary obstruction, 
then there's no shame in asking a surgeon to offer uh, a surgical alternative to TAVI yeah. if the patient would do well both in the short term in terms of their hospital recovery and getting out of the OR and in the longer term in terms of the durability of the device mm. that the surgeon would use. And that's particularly relevant, of, of course, when we start to talk about patients with associated anatomy. So here's a nice uh, image, a volume rendered CT image of a patient with a, a relatively large uh, ascending uh, aortic aneurysm. And we can't deal with that by means of TAVI. So we need to remember that the surgeons have expertise beyond that that uh, interventional cardiologists can offer. And the same is true if you have a heavily bical uh, calcified bicuspid valve and very complex coronary artery disease. It may well be that the surgeon will do a better overall job that even the most skilled interventional cardiologist can achieve. So we need to remember that as well. So, um, so moving forward, we, we've talked about lots of theoretical considerations in terms of diagnosis, planning, device selection, and so forth. But it would be very interesting to look at some cases, Marcus, and perhaps see how you translate this um, pre-procedural planning into the performance of a procedure. So perhaps you could take us through one case in detail, and then we could talk about some of the variations thereafter. In fact, I, I have three cases to show you. And let's start with the non-RAFE type, um, type zero bicuspid aortic valve. As it is shown here, it is a valve, um, you see the CT with two cusps, um, and um, here it's moderate calcification. And what we see is the calcification also, it is symmetrically at both sides of the valve. Um, sometimes we see, and that brings us in problems, we see only at one side calcification and not at the other side, or we have a lot of calcification here. In this case, it's moderate, so more uncommon. But it's a very big analysis measurement, more than 29, and uh, we see this also often, that uh, we deal more often with bigger anatomies. And when you look at the root chart here, oh, yes, it's coming. Uh, we see the valve has only two inch points. So how to align a root when it has only two inch points? So, so our root shot and a coplanar view can fail and we have to deal with this also. Um, in most, um, nearly in all cases, I do uh, balloon sizing and here in this case I knew that it was a 29 uh, valve and uh, even we uh, added more volume in this 29 valve. But in all cases we make sure that not the smaller valve, so here in this case a 26 would be the better choice. So we use a 25 balloon here if it's in the Edwards set. We give contrast and uh, this balloon sizing gives us a lot of information. So what we see first is the balloon stays in the middle, shifts not to one side and sometimes impact of um, calcification could be that, uh, especially when it is uh, asymmetric, that the uh, balloon and also the valve shifts to a weaker side and can cause there an injury. And we also with the balloon we see there is no, uh, Im uh, no uh, influence to the coronary arteries and um, so it gives us some ideas what is the impact of the calcification and how is the, um, the anatomy. And here we decided for a 29 sapien uh, valve and we added two additional milliliters what makes the f uh, valve frame around about one millimeter in diameter bigger. And we implant the valve very high. We do it, um, uh, we like this in, um, in bicuspid valve, a high implantation, and we learned that the ceiling is very good. We cover all the long leaflets behind the valve frame, and also we saw a low pacemaker rate. And here you see the result. The valve is very high implanted and has a good functional result here, also with a lot of contrast uh, giving in, into the root. And uh, on the right side, then, uh, we see also in the post-CT that the valve is fully deployed round. Mm -hmm. And also, at the inflow, it became a bit bigger because of the additional volume. So when we look in detail, the same case now. Um, once again, the implantation view, we have only uh, two inch points, and we have to deal with this. And we cannot 100% uh, believe the implantation view. I'll tell you how we uh, okay. do it later. Going, that's exactly what I was going to ask you, because the, the CT scan tells us which, which uh, yeah, so imaging plane to use. The predicted view based on the CT is so measurement in a CT 
uh, with two inch points, the alignment is difficult. And most of us, we use uh, Tremensio software. It's based on a centerline uh, analysis, but it could be misleading. And what we learned is that often analog size is overestimated. We mm -hmm. published also uh, um, a sizing paper. Um, I mentioned this. Is that, really, is that the slide that we that skipped? We, should, we what, skipped. Should, we, should we quickly go back to that um, slide? We can, so I can describe it. It is um, so we need three inch points to three dimensionally um, align an annulus, but we have only two. So what we do, we align the two inch points and then we rotate around the two inch points and we m make multiple measurements and the smaller, smallest measurement, annulus measurement, what we get, we use for our valve choice. And um, so here also in um, panel B, um, valve crossing could be a problem in a big anatomy. Sometimes we uh, use an AL1, uh, AL2 instead of an AL1 casita. There are different techniques. We usually in this big anatomy, I try to start with wiring the left and then I uh, pull back the casita and it comes mm -hmm. then more, it goes from left to the non-coronary side. And on the way, we will cross the valve opening usually in the commission. So you map the anatomy as you yes. manipulate the catheter yes, millimeter by millimeter. Yeah. And um, I do it in, uh, in type zero, but also in type mm -hmm. uh, one. We know where the rafe is, uh, ra rafe is. Mm -hmm. And um, so don't try to cross where the rafe is. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense, and we sure. know it by CT. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned the AL1 and the AL2, but one, I think sometimes you use a different selection of catheters, particularly for horizontal aortas. Yeah, um, we also start with AL1 and uh, then switch to AL2, especially in large anatomies. But uh, especially in uh, horizontal um, 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 aortic roots, we have made the experience that using the, the EBU or XB catheter mm -hmm could be quite useful, the, the curve. The coronary guide catheter. Yeah, coronary yeah. guide catheter. Uh, for those who have not tried, uh, I really recommend, because, uh, you, you know, uh, even as an experienced TAVI operator, it can be challenging to mm -hmm. cross the aortic valve in bicuspid anatomies. And if you do not get along with standard catheters, AL1, AL2, it might be an option to try uh, EBU 3.5 or 3.75. The problem in this anatomy often is that we cannot come high enough to the left side. Mm -hmm. and so, but you can manage this also with the AL2. How to manage, bring the AL2 all the way in, it will go uh, towards the left main. Mm -hmm. And then once it, uh, the AL1 is placed, uh, AL2 is placed in the left cusp, then place the wire and pull it back and then you can come also from left to the non-side. Mm -hmm. So it, there are some tips and tricks. Yep. I mentioned balloon sizing, we do it in most cases. And then um, uh, once back to the implantation view, in D we show how we align, we align in addition the valve itself. So uh, look that the valve frame is aligned. This is also um, used by core valve. You, we have the, uh, the ring, we align the ring. It's the same we can do with the sapien valve. And when we want to get in a high position, bring the central marker. Um, at least three millimeter, that's one central marker length above the line in between the two inch points. And so this, this is, is, the, this the, is the red line on our slide. That's the red yeah. line on our slide. And mm -hmm. then uh, E and F, panel E and F shows you the implantation result. It's, it, it's close to 100% aortic, but we see uh, we have the uh, knowledge that we can get to a good result in this mm -hmm. position. Can I just hit take you back a little bit to the balloon sizing markers because we've got some specific questions from our audience about that. So are you using, um, what, what's the ratio to your annular measurement? Which size balloon do you select? That's my first so, question. So it is, uh, with balloon sizing, I use the size of the balloon of the smaller valve of choice. Okay. So that means, for example, here, um, more or less it was a 29 valve, but sometimes we have a measurement, for example, mm -hmm. of 27, let's say it's 27. Mm -hmm. Then a 25, we use a 25 balloon out of the Edwards kit because it's, it's free. Mm -hmm. it's, um, and um, it's also very useful, or you can also take a 26 balloon. And we make sure that not the smaller valve of choice is the, the valve what okay. we 
um, what is the better, um, uh, what has the better size, and the balloon clearly will show us this. Okay, so you're you're demonstrating the uh, balloon at full expansion, how close it comes to the uh, walls of the aorta and yes. the sinuses. So we see the two inch points of yeah. the, the mm -hmm. um, here in this case of the uh, left and the non cusp. Or, um, we, uh, so when the balloon touches clearly the two inch points, mm -hmm. then uh, and um, then it's one, it's a major criteria that the um, balloon size, uh, it's a valve size could be the same than the balloon size. Mm. Okay. And um, so when this, uh, like here, the balloon is much smaller and uh, it does not touch the inch points, then there's no way to use the smaller valve. And are you routinely looking at what happens to the valve leaflets and the flow in the coronaries? So um, we, um, you, because uh, you don't have the, when you choose now the bigger valve, mm. you don't see the complete reality. Mm. But you see how much material is in the valve and you see in which direction you push it. And you have an idea what mm. can happen when yeah. you use a bigger valve uh, okay. in this case. And one thing uh, very important is really, lo we have to, uh, I look that the va uh, balloon is really stays in, this, in the middle of the, um, the valve and is not shifted to one side. And it's especially in, raf uh, ra uh, in rave type, it could be when you have a very stiff rave mm. that the sh balloon is shifted to, um, uh, to the other side. And when there's no calcification, for example, then you can make an injury. Okay. Because, um, and given that balloon sizing or pre-dilatation is an extra step, do you, do you routinely use cerebral protection? Do you think it increases the risk of so a stroke? In our experience, because we did it in the past, um, uh, very often we um, pre-ballooned um, uh, the valves, and I do it with self-expanding valves. My opinion is we have to prepare the valve, and uh, that uh, a self-expanding valve can um, fully deploy and mm -hmm. you can place it precise. Um, there are other opinions about this, but it's my opinion. Um, so we have a, um, um, a long uh, experience with this and when we compare our data with the, um, with the published um, uh, data, we don't cause more strokes with this. Okay, and that's reassuring. And one, I know you've had a lot of experience with the Boston Accurate valve. W would you have the same practice week to week, day to day? Uh, the, the Boston Accurate valve, uh, you have to be aware that uh, it has a much lower radio force. So mm. uh, pre-dilatation in most anatomies is mandatory, except mm -hmm. for mildly calcified patients. But I think this is a very good question, Bernard, because um, uh, Raj Maka uh, recently published uh, a study on bicuspid aortic valves um, using the S3 mm -hmm. in a large population based on the TVT registry, I think, and uh, uh, they found that uh, there is a higher rate of stroke in patients with bicuspid aortic valve. Mm. So, I saw of this course, in our collective also. So, yeah. it, there, it has. Um, so, I, I think there is a big question mark. Something that we need to be all be thinking about. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when we have younger patients, uh, mm. then perhaps in this uh, cases we have mm. to use cell sure. protection. So Marcus, you've talked us through a, a non-rafe case. Yes. Let's move now to a, a case with a rafe. Yes, so that's the next case and... Uh, okay. Can we advance uh, the slide, please? It's frozen. Oh there yeah, okay. So, so here it's um, uh, a typical um, um, case with a uh, rave in between. Here you can see it also in a root shot. It is in between non and right cusp and then there is a bigger gap to the left cusp and there's an arrow shows uh, where um, um, the opening of the valve is. And this is also has an impact where you try with your wire. Mm. Don't try to cross in between non and, and right here. And this information you get from the CT. Mm. Balloon sizing here, in this case, it was um, a 23 um, balloon. It touches clear the inch points. 23 valve was the valve of choice. And uh, as there was a lot of calcification, we were careful. And I'm often careful, more careful with, um, I'm always careful, but I'm more sure careful with bicuspid mm -hmm. when there's a lot of calcification. So we deployed the, here also the sapien in, in 
two steps. So we under deployed it first with uh, minus two milliliters. That makes the valve more compliant. As you see here in the non coronary side, the valve frame is not complete straightened and it is. Um, it gives um, uh, a better way out for the, uh, for the calcification. And, but we saw here that there was still a uh, paravalvular leak. And then in the second step, we postulated it nominal. We straightened the valve um, uh, frame better, as you see. We could achieve um, um, a better result. And also, I think, uh, perhaps when you do it um, stepwise um, and you give not um, it's, it's all the pressure in a short time on the on the tissue when you do it in two steps, perhaps it has also makes it safer. Mm -hmm. Tissue can adapt a bit, and here finally we got also a good result. And so you know, it's this are uh, the more common cases, and I think um, uh, these are the kind of cases you, uh, um, in your opinion, it's the same. More, it's very similar to the treatment of. Mm. Um, of a tricuspid valve. Do you have any additional tips and tricks to, to add? I mean, Marcus has given us a very detailed step-by-step -step, uh, review of how he performs a bicuspid valve TAVI procedure one. Have you, have you got any additional points from your own practice? Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe um, uh, Marcus showed us uh, um, two very nice examples and very um, illustrative uh, examples on using um, balloon expandable devices. And uh, I think that uh, actually in most anatomies, uh, you can also use uh, self-expanding mm -hmm. uh, technologies. And if, if you use self-expanding technologies, it is really important, uh, as you already mentioned, actually, to have an effective pre dilatation in most anatomies, it really depends on the uh, amount of calcification that you have. Um, Positioning-wise, um, I try also when using um, um, <coughs> self-expanding devices to achieve a high position. Because, uh, but but this is uh, actually independent of uh, whether you have a tricuspid or bicuspid yeah. uh, um, aortic valve. With most devices, what you can achieve with a higher position is that uh, you have a better uh, co uh, competence, you have less PVL, mm -hmm. and you may reduce substantially, uh, independent of the device that you use, the uh, rate of conduction disturbances. Mm -hmm. So I try to achieve a higher position, but uh, you, you know there are some reports of having a supraannular uh, positioning. Uh, which in some rare cases can uh, result in a good outcome. But I've also seen uh, embolizations. So mm. I think one should be careful to have a too high positioning. Sure. I mean, a very important point that we're all making, I think, is that also given that the uh, height of deployment in bicuspid valve anatomy is particularly important that you should be using a device that you are very comfortable and familiar with. Oh yeah, this is one that you know that you yeah. can you can land on the spot yeah. very accurately and consistently mm -hmm. day in day out so that the device that you're most comfortable with is probably the one that you should stick with when you're doing more challenging cases. Would you agree with that general message, Marcus? Yes, I yeah. fully agree with this. Yeah. And uh, once again, high positioning is really also one key point. But mm -hmm. When you use a superannular device and you place it even higher than what what's in the future with the coronary access. This so is that's, uh, that's mm. always my yeah. concern. Yeah, sure. this is an important aspect. What about advances in skirt technology, Marcus? Yeah, perhaps I have a I show the mm. last case because uh, the last case is a case done with the Sapien Ultra um, uh, the, um, valve, Sapien Ultra in the smaller sizes 20, 23, and 26, has an as high skirt as the 29 valve. 29 valve is still the same. So, and the higher skirt, uh, in fact, is very effective in sealing. And here it is a 25.5 annulus, 26 Sapien Ultra, also implanted high as possible, as you see here. And then you see the high position here and the functional results. So I think in the future, sure, um, there are even better technical, uh, techniques or uh, devices available, and um, it's not the end of the story of treatment of bicuspid valves. Mm. And this patient with a mitral ring, you'll be bringing back for a transeptal 
Uh, so we know that <laughs> it's uh, now approved also in Europe for for uh, in mitral position. Yes, yeah. maybe one day in the future. <laughs> so Marcus, it's very good of you to share all these practical tips and tricks from your your high volume practice and. Just tell us about a nice paper that you produced for the community recently. I think it's on uh, the, uh, it's it on the a, next slide or? Uh, perhaps no. over and, oh, so it's gone. So we, uh, we published uh, papers, uh, a tips and tricks paper in European Heart uh, for uh, the one who want to read about this. And also we published a sizing paper for this problem of mm -hmm. type zero bicuspid valves in, um, um, in CCI, I think, and um, so. Okay, so maybe with your permission, we could tag that uh, that reference to yes, this webinar sure. for for our participants uh, to I would be happy <laughs> to to read in the future because it contains a lot of detailed information that we haven't been able to cover today. I do need to go back to one point, and I, I'll answer the question directly. But one of our colleagues was still a little bit unclear about the intercommissural distance and the four millimeters. But just to clarify for you, whoever is out there, that this is a supraannular measurement. Exactly. Uh, and it's, it's four millimetres above the aortic annular plane, just yep. for that clarification. Yep. Yep. So we're going to um, just do a summary now in terms of the take-home messages of our discussions today. Uh, it's been very enjoyable talking to you both, and I, I've learned a lot as we've gone through the, the detailed structure of this webinar. But the important point firstly to remember is that bicuspid aortic valve anatomy is coming your way because this, uh, this anatomical pattern is more and more common in younger, younger patients and is going to be very much part of our uh, TAVI practice in the years to come. Maybe 10 or even 20% of our cases will have bicuspid aortic valves as time goes by. The conversations that we've had with one have very clearly demonstrated that the CT scan is fundamentally important uh, in demonstrating uh, the bicuspid anatomy in diagnostic terms, but also provided very, providing very sophisticated levels of detail regarding the patterns of fusion, which as Marcus has told us will have a direct impact on the planning of your procedure but also telling us more about the, the bulk of calcification on the aortic valve leaflets, the potential risks to the coronary arteries at the time of valve implantation, and also, of course, telling us about uh, the ascending aorta. Is there an aneurysm and surgery may be a better option in some patients? And something that we haven't focused on in great detail, the iliofemoral anatomy and its tortuosity and its suitability for transfemoral access. And finally, with the help of Marcus's nice teaching cases, we, we realize that the, the procedural steps can be quite challenging. There's the increase, a need for an increased repertoire of, of uh, crossing catheters, to use a balloon for pre-sizing in many cases and pre-dilatation, particularly if you're using a self-expanding valve. And these very careful uh, steps of attention to detail are fundamentally important to achieve the best outcomes for our patients. So thank you for joining us in this uh, webinar. Thank you to Edwards Life Sciences for providing support with the logistics. I hope it's been instructive and educational for you, and I thank you for joining us.